Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We have Nate Cardo Cardozo. Yes, yes, please raise your hand. Staff Attorney on the Electronic Frontier Foundation Civil Digital Civil Liberties Team. And Andrew Crocker, who is a staff attorney on the Electric County Foundation Civil Liberties Team, and you get to introduce the rest of them. Good stuff. Hello. So, yes, we, we, in addition to our coders rights legal team, we have some of our uh, technologists uh, from uh, EFF with us as well. Uh, Bill Buddington and Cooper Quinton and Noah Swartz. Uh, so we're going to do a brief uh, introduction. Each of us will, will say a little bit about uh, what we've been working on um, and then we'll open it up to your questions. Uh, we brought our, our technologists on the stage so you can ask questions about our technology uh, project as well as some of the legal issues. Um, as, uh, as usual, if you've been to one of these before, we uh, have some, uh, I guess, uh, uh, suggestions on how questions are. First of all, that uh, while one of the things we do at the Coders Rights Project is provide legal counsel uh, for free to security researchers, uh, this is not the forum to ask questions about your legal advice. That should be done in a private conversation uh, at another place at another time. Uh, so uh, we, we welcome your, your questions and they can certainly touch upon legal issues. But if it is uh, specifically about something that you're doing or planning to doing, or wondering if it would be legal if you did, that uh, those are questions that should be done uh, done privately. <laughs> uh, so let me uh, give a, a, a brief introduction uh, to myself. So uh, my name is Kurt Opsall. I'm an attorney with, with EFF. Uh, I work on our coders uh, rights project. Um, and as I just said, that's where we uh, provide some uh, legal advice and counseling to security researchers. Um, I wanted to uh, touch on uh, briefly uh, something that, that some of you may have uh, uh, heard about, uh, that we are uh, representing uh, Chris Roberts, uh, and he is a security researcher, um, hey Chris, uh, and uh, was recently uh, detained uh, by the FBI uh, after uh, tweeting during a, a flight about some security issues. Um, and we're going to try to uh, help him navigate that that situation. Um, that that said, uh, we're not going to uh, do too much uh, uh, talking about that in this session. So um, we'll ask not to do questions on that topic uh, during this. Ask the EFF. Uh, and, and with that, we'll try and keep our our introductions short. So I will pass the mic to Bill. Hi there, um, my name is Bill Buddington. Uh, I am a software engineer at the EFF. Um, I've worked on various projects. Um, one of the primary projects I've been working on over the past year is called Phantom DC. Um, it's something that basically takes Congress and kicking and screaming wraps them in an API um, because they don't like that, um, but we find it important to have the tools of democracy be in the public sphere. Um, so we want that to be a tool that's easily usable by everyone. Uh, we've deployed it and uh, various other organizations in uh, our same space have deployed it. Um, and uh, it's something that I feel like is a very important project for open sourcing democracy. Um, I've also uh, worked a little bit on Let's Encrypt, uh, the client side of Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt is a project that basically brings um, the process of getting SSL certificates, um, uh, makes it much easier to do, um, makes it a much more streamlined process, and also makes it a free process. Um, so, uh, you know, system admins that want to deploy SSL on sites that they run uh, can do so in a, a timely and efficient manner, and, uh, and also uh, has all the security guarantees that uh, TLS and SSL currently have. Um, so those are a few of the projects I've been working on, uh, and uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Nate. I'm Nate Cardozo. I'm a staff attorney uh, at EFF. I work on the coders' rights team with Kurt and Andrew, um, and I'm one of the lawyers representing Chris. I do a number of other projects at EFF. All of my work focuses on free speech and privacy. Uh, I'm suing the government of Ethiopia for wiretapping. They owned the computer of an American citizen in Silver Spring, Maryland, 
and wiretapped his Skype calls. And I'm going to argue that case in a couple of months. We don't have a date yet. Um, I also uh, work on EFF's Who Has Your Back report. This is the, the, the big chart where we recognize companies that have best practices in terms of protecting your data against government overreach. So I get to be on the nice calls with the companies where they yell and scream at me when I tell them I'm not going to give them a gold star. Um, it's amazing the, the lengths that companies will go for what we all used to like to get in kindergarten. The gold star has, uh, has worth. I don't know why exactly, but it does. Um, so those are the things that I do at EFF. And now Cooper. Hi, uh, I'm Cooper Quinton. I'm a staff technologist at EFF. I work on a number of different projects. My main project is Privacy Badger, which is our browser extension to block creepy third-party tracking online. Uh, I also work on HTTPS Everywhere, which is our browser extension that tries to get you to use HTTPS whenever possible. Uh, I do web and privacy research. Uh, and another project that I've been working on recently is called Canary Watch, which is a website and a tool that will track uh, warrant canaries for changes and takedowns. What's a warrant canary? A warrant canary is a, um, so a, first I should explain what a national security letter is. A national security letter is a um, FBI order. They're a, a, a court order that the DOJ can send you. And uh, they're, which orders you to give up uh, business documents, communications of your customers essentially. Subscriber information, thank you. Um, that national security letter also has a gag order attached to it, which says that you can't tell anybody other than your lawyer that you've received this national security letter. And that gag order isn't overseen by a judge. This is the only process of this type. Any random special agent in charge of an investigation, an FBI investigation, can send you this process and gag you from talking about it. So a warrant canary is a piece of text on your website or uh, wherever else that says, we have not received any national security letters. And if you do receive a national security letter, you could take that down or stop updating it. So Canary Watch watches these warrant canaries for changes and takedowns. Um, so that's another project that I work on. Thanks. I'm Andrew Crocker. I'm a staff attorney at EFF. I um, was previously a fellow, so I'm the newest staff attorney. Um, and I work on the Cutter's Rights Project with Nate and Kurt. I also do a lot of work on our national security and mass surveillance cases. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with our cases against the NSA and their various forms of mass surveillance. Uh, one that's new in that area and, and may be read in the Wall Street Journal in January or more recently in the USA Today that the DEA is also engaged in mass surveillance. They collected um, all of Americans' phone calls to various countries for a very long time, since the early 90s. And in fact, this program that they've been running since the 90s was the inspiration for the NSA's phone records tracking program. Um, and so we at EFF wanted to do something about that. And with our friends at Human Rights Watch, we just filed suit against the DEA and we're trying to uh, make sure that program is fully stopped. Uh, the DEA has said some things about how it's, it's concluded it very conveniently right after Edward Snowden came out. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna get to the bottom of that with Human Rights Watch. Um, I'm Noah Swartz. I'm also a staff technologist at the EFF. I work on Privacy Badger with Cooper. Uh, Privacy Badger is a browser extension that tries to watch for third-party resources on websites giving you tracking cookies or cookies that can uniquely identify you. It blocks you from getting these cookies in the first place and it blocks requests from these websites if it notices that they're tracking you across multiple domains. So as you go and read the New York Times and CNN and ABC, if the same resource is trying to look at which articles you're reading on all of those sites, it stops accepting requests from them so they can't see what you're reading online or what websites you're going to. Um, additionally, I work on this uh, Privacy Lab, which is a, sort of an outreach program for people working on privacy tools or who do uh, privacy activism. We have an event coming up April 23rd uh, at the Mozilla office. Uh, and if you'd like to go to that, I highly recommend it. Um, you can find more information uh, wiki.mozilla.org slash privacy slash privacy underscore lab. Uh, and I'd like to see all of you there. All right, so 
That was our, our brief introduction, so uh, we would like uh, to, to start uh, answering your questions. Uh, if you have any, we have the, the mic out there for, for people to uh, ask uh, amplified questions. Um, so let me see, does anybody uh, have any questions that they would like to, uh, to ask uh, EFF? Oh, come on, you know you got a question. All right, Chris. Uh, that that is an excellent question. Uh, how do you get hold uh, of EFF if you get in trouble? Um, the the best way to do it is actually to email info at eff dot org. We have uh, a full time uh, intake uh, coordinator who uh, uh, tracks all those emails coming in, works with the internal teams to find the, the appropriate person to respond. Uh, in some instances, we'll be able to represent uh, people directly. Uh, in other instances, uh, we will uh, refer uh, to additional counsel who you can work with. Unfortunately, we do not have the bandwidth to uh, take uh, all, all the uh, requests that we receive but uh, we do our best to make sure that people are in good hands. Hi. Hello. Um, I work at a small startup here in San Francisco, and what I was wondering is, do you have some self-service documents that we could provide to our legal department, our developers, our marketing people, so that we as an organization, rather than maybe doing an ad hoc job of trying to take care of people's privacy, that we're actually being a little bit more uniformly holistic about it. Uh, uh, so thank you. I'll, I'll um, address at least some of that, which is sort of. Uh, we have some things like uh, well, a white paper on best practices for logging. Um, and you can look to that to, to see what would be some good practices there. Um, we don't have something like a, a standard privacy policy because we actually think that you shouldn't have a standard one. The privacy policy to describe what a particular company does, and it's going to vary company by company. But for some of the best practices on how to protect your user, uh, we have who has your back. And let me turn this over to Nate to explain a little bit about what we look for in that. So yeah, as Kurt mentioned, we do have a white paper on online service providers' best practices. So definitely check that out. Uh, and then in terms of the who has your back report, we, we, we try and, and say what we think best practices are. Uh, in terms of protecting user data. Always require a warrant before turning over content. Always notify your user uh, before turning over content and give the user an opportunity to contest it. Uh, unless, of course, you're gagged, then you have to follow the gag. Um, things like that. And then be transparent. Tell your users what your policies are. Uh, one of the things that, that we recommend early stage startups do is wrap their heads around what they're going to do the first time they get legal process. Have a plan. You don't necessarily have to have fully fleshed out policies, but you do need to know in general what you're going to do. And if what you're going to do is call EFF, that's great. Make sure your frontline employees know that that's the plan. Um, if, your, if your policy is call outside counsel, make sure that the frontline employees know that that's the policy and make sure they know that they're going to do that before they comply with the process. Um, additionally, if your startup is something that provides a service to people and you collect data about the users of your product, um, Privacy Badger includes in it a do not track policy, which we think respects users' privacy and it's a standards for how to anonymize data and how long to retain it and additional uh, sort of privacy practices that we as the EFF um, think are good. And if you do so, then Privacy Badger will allow you to use cookies for session information. So if you are providing a service, it's something that you should read. And hopefully, um, I'll let Cooper. So the so the the do not track policy document is if you're providing a third party service if you if your product is being embedded in other people's websites this will uh, 
indicate that you do respect do not track and a very specific set of a very specific set of standards for that. So there's been a lot of bills in front of Congress right now. They're calling it Cyber Legislation Week. Um, there's been a bunch of different activities from different groups uh, opposing or supporting the various bills in Congress. I haven't seen a lot of work from the EFF on these bills, and I'm wondering if you guys, well, maybe I missed it. I'm wondering if you guys think that being in San Francisco has isolated you from the power elite in Washington, and if you need a bigger presence in D.C. So most of the work that we do, uh, that we're doing right now at least, is behind the scenes. Mark Jaycox, who's trying to hide behind that banner back there, is our full-time legislative analyst. Uh, he's on calls most of the day, every day. Um, Kurt and I are working with a, a, a number of different groups. Um, but at this point, it's very much behind the scenes. I'm not sure there's anything we support right now <laughs> that's in Congress. Uh, we, you know, so I guess 215 D auth is. Do you think great. that you need to have a bigger presence in Washington to be more effective or not? Or are you okay out here on San Francisco? Uh, we, we are okay out here in, in beautiful, sunny San Francisco. Um, and, you know, so th this is a little bit of different strategies that there are, there's, uh, ways in which you can influence, uh, uh, policies, uh, that are, uh, sort of an inside play when you're in, in DC, uh, and there are ways that, that you can do outside. So we attempt to, uh, try and make the world a better place, make a future that we want to live in through a more of an outside play. So we get a lot of grassroots activism. Uh, this is a little bit of what, uh, Bill was talking about. Uh, making it easier for constituents to get in touch with their representatives and tell them what they think uh, uh, are important to them, and legislatures uh, uh, listen to that. Um, we we also um, try and put out you know policy positions, explain our our, our positions in, in blog posts, and we have done so on some of these cybersecurity uh, uh, bills that are coming up. Uh, a lot of that was around the time they were uh, first. Uh, proposed by the White House, um, so this was in uh, January sometime. Uh, but we've also been sort of active in trying to get a grassroots uh, support or opposition to, to bills. Uh, we have a uh, connections in D.C., uh, but there's also an insider strategy, and there are groups based in D.C. who do more of that. They have more, uh, you know, direct meetings with, uh, with legislatures um, and with their staff. Um, and, you know, there's, there's value to that uh, approach as well. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology, or CDT, they are based in, in D.C. Uh, they do more of, of, of that approach. They're very much an insider group. And as you may know, or, or may not, because it's getting to be kind of old history now, but uh, that was, there was a split at one point where uh, a portion of EFF went and founded CDT, uh, wanting to pursue more of that strategy, while a portion of EFF uh, keep it, kept the name and moved to San Francisco to do more of a uh, an outsider litigation uh, and grassroots strategy. Um, and I think you know there's there's a place in the ecosystem for for both. Um, it's also important, and activism team uh, at EFF can tell you this a lot better than I can um, to build coalitions that can get the job done together. So we work with you know as you said uh, C, uh, CDT and other organizations such as the Sunlight Foundation um, that are situated in the Beltway um, so that we can uh, more effectively reach out to uh, the legislative bodies that, that do exist. Um, a lot, I mean, basically, when I, whenever I go up to uh, uh, the activism portion of the building, they're always basically on the phone with, uh, you know, coalition building, uh, creating those links that are important to actually get the word out. Um, and you can visit our website, act.eff.org. We have a number of actions that are available um, that you can uh, take part in um, that are calling for any number of things. For instance, uh, stopping the mass uh, bulk collection by the NSA or um, stopping the new size, uh, CISA bill uh, or any number of uh, things. The technology that makes that possible is uh, is something that we've been building uh, through our action center um, and a lot of the organizations in the Beltway are using that now too. 
Um, and also, uh, so the action center is one. And there's a part, a piece of like micro infrastructure, I would say, called, and I've been working very closely on this part, called Phantom DC, which is Phantom of the Capital. Um, and it's basically um, something that wraps the process of filling out congressional forms in an API, as I said. So the server actually goes out and through Phantom JS fills out uh, forms for the end user and common sizes. So you you know typically if you're targeting the Senate and the House, you have to um, know your uh, zip plus four. You have to fill out your uh, first name three times for each one of your members of Congress. Um, you have to know who your members of Congress are. A lot of uh, zip codes are split in that. Um, so this kind of process is very arduous for most people uh, just trying to get in contact with their reps. Um, it, this has been streamlined, and this problem has basically been fixed by open sourcing the tools of democracy, not um, through any congressional action, but through grassroots uh, activism making it possible uh, for us to get in contact with our reps. So, um, if, and I'm happy to talk about any of the um, technology stack that is involved there as well. I was seeing, do you guys have anything to say about the upcoming uh, Patriot Act reauthorization in a few months or whatever? Um, sure. So, uh, what, what do you, the question was about the uh, upcoming, I guess, well, I would phrase it the upcoming sunset of Section 215 of the Patriot Act. Uh, the, the question, of course, is whether it will be reauthorized. Uh, so Section 215 of the Patriot Act uh, it was first enacted uh, along with the rest of the Patriot Act in the wake of 9-11 on October uh, 2001. And the provision said that uh, it, it empowered the government to obtain uh, some records, some tangible things, actually was the, the term. Um, and uh, to, to do so with a uh, less than the sort of the ordinary uh, process. Um, and at the time uh, when it was passed, it was it was known as the library provision. The the fear of civil libertarians uh, was that the government would would use this to obtain library records, look at what books you checked out, and maybe make some assumptions about what your uh, intents or behavior were uh, based on your library books. And it was uh, opposed at that time. Uh, and I could sort of only imagine that the, the government was sort of, you know, chortling uh, when they saw this because, in, in fact, they were using it for uh, something something else and, and far more uh, uh, expansive and, I would say, nefarious. Um, under uh, this, this section, um, they started in uh, around uh, 2004 uh, to uh, issue 215 orders to various telecommunication service providers. Uh, saying that uh, uh, they want all the records of all your customers' calls, uh, you know, foreign and domestic, local included, um, every 90 days, and then they would issue another one the next uh, 90 days. Uh, this was the, the telephone uh, records program. Uh, previous to 2004, they had been doing this based upon the executive uh, authority, the, the president's sort of inherent power as, as a president. Uh, it turns out that wasn't a particularly strong legal basis. Uh, there, was a, there was a big debate uh, within the government about whether that was good enough, which led to threats of resignation from uh, the attorney general and the, the then director of the FBI. Uh, and so eventually they, they decided to switch it, not to stop the program, but to come up with a, well, shall we say, creative legal argument that this section 215 uh, provided that authority and then for the years since they've been gobbling up all of your records of all of the calls. Oh, All right. Um, and so uh, uh, as things were done in the Patriot Act and is often done when there are uh, provisions that uh, are, are heartily argued against by uh, people who are concerned about civil liberties they say, well, you know, we're in a special time right now, but I'll tell you what, we'll put a sunset provision in it so that <coughs> on its own authority it will uh, expire after a, a certain period of time. Um, and uh, this section will expire on June 1st uh, unless Congress does something 
to uh, reauthorize it and uh, what, what has happened since it was last reauthorized and, uh, and today is that the uh, uh, Edward Snowden leaks have uh, revealed in, in some glorious detail what had been reported on in the news previously, but now we got to see the actual orders to, for example, Verizon Business Services showing uh, a 90-day a order for all of the records, uh, and this has, has made it so uh, many people, ourselves included, have been saying that we should not reauthorize this. It was a bad idea. It wasn't what the intent, even the, uh, the author of the Patriot Act uh, would, would concede that this was not what was intended by this bill. Uh, and so uh, this is now, if there's any time to uh, do reforms and to try to rein in uh, the government's power to look at all the records, uh, now is that time. Uh, Nate? And if you want to help the fight against 215, you can go to fight215.org. It's an EFF-led coalition of 32 different organizations um, who are trying desperately to make sure that 215 is not reauthorized on June 1st. So fight215.org. Uh, no, what? Mark is shaking his head. Never mind. It's fight215.org, isn't it? Okay, to end mass surveillance under the Patriot Act, um, hopefully also including not reauthorizing 215. Sure. I'll, I'll, yeah. That's good enough. All right. Anyone else? More questions? So what is the current status of the lawsuit against the LA Police Department and LA Sheriff's Department for one week's worth of license plate data? And how does the recent release of all the license plate reader data from the Oakland Police Department figure into that, if at all? Okay, so background on the question, EFF and ACLU of Southern California sued the LA Sheriff's Department and the LA Police Department for one week's worth of ALPR, automatic license plate reader, data um, from uh, a week during Ramadan a couple of years ago. Uh, the LA Sheriff and LAPD denied our request, saying that every, every single license plate capture in Los Angeles that week was part of an ongoing investigation, uh, and that as such, they didn't have to release the data uh, exempt under the California Public Records Act. Um, we sued, we, we filed a, a petition for writ of mandate in Los Angeles Superior Court, lost at the district court level, uh, and the appeal was heard last month or the month before, um, and I believe the California Court of Appeal has 90 days by statute to rule on that. So we'll get a ruling next month, probably. They usually wait until the last day because they're judges and they can do that. Um, so we'll get a ruling next month or so. How does the release of the Oakland data affect the case? Not at all. Uh, the Oakland PD uh, had no problem releasing the same data that uh, to Ars Technica uh, and a reporter named Saru Farvar, um, who's a, a, a great guy and a good friend. Um, the, that release makes no difference. Um, different agencies are allowed to interpret the law differently uh, and they're allowed to be completely arbitrary about it and that makes no difference. Welcome to California Public, Public Records Act law. Oh, we also have a, a great visualization on our site of that Oakland data um, that's such as music, it sounds like you've heard it, but it's um, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, I believe there are some within EFF who have taken a position against the sale of exploits, like zero days and whatnot, and you occasionally hear from some quarters accusations of hypocrisy uh, on that because you also say code is speech. So I wonder what you make of all this and whether EFF actually does have an institutional position on the sale of exploits. All right, thank, thank you for, for raising that. So first of all, absolutely, code is speech. This is something which is core to EFF, and uh, we were part of the uh, first code, uh, first case that, uh, that addressed that. Um, and so, uh, and, and this, is, this has not been varied, and you know, if 
Uh, if there were to be a law that said that you could not uh, talk about an exploit, give away an exploit, that that law would face some serious First Amendment uh, problems. Um, what we have asked people to do, not so much as have a law to prevent this, but uh, to think about whether a, the, the exploit would be best uh, exposed as a, as a vulnerability and trying to, to fix the problem. I mean, the concern is that uh, if uh, an exploit is, is being used uh, uh, improperly, and we have seen examples of, of where exploits have gone to governments, including our own, and uh, been used in ways that are not uh, freedom enhancing, but rather to, to increase uh, surveillance and, and spying. Um, and that is something that it would be, it would be better for society if we work together to try and uh, identify vulnerabilities and, and get them fixed. And there's, there's a balancing that, that can be done. And one of the things actually we, we are trying to find out a little bit more about is how uh, the U.S. government does that balancing. Uh, that, you know, you might say, look, the exploit is, a, is an O-Day on a system that is only used by a uh, foreign military uh, that, you know, th there's not much chance for consumer harm out of that, and that may be correct. But if it's an exploit on a, you know, popular operating system that is, you know, used by uh, as average civilians all around the world, that uh, it is better off if we try and fix that vulnerability because it could be found by others, it could be being exploited by others, and that the dangers inherent of having that exploit uh, unpatched are, are greater dangerous. Uh, so we, we actually did a Freedom of Information Act request to try and get more information about the government's uh, vulnerability equities process, um, which um, I'll turn over to Andrew to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so after the um, Heartbleed revelations last April, I guess, um, there was a story now now said to be false um, that the NSA knew about Heartbleed. Um, and in response to that, the NSA and other parts of the government came out and said, no, no, we, we didn't know about Heartbleed. And in fact, we have this policy that Kurt was mentioning, the vulnerabilities equities process, that helps us decide whether we should disclose a vulnerability that we find out about. Um, we, we usually disclose, but in some rare cases, we, we don't disclose it and we use it for intelligence purposes. And that's about all they said about it. Um, that led to us, us to file a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, unsurprisingly, they didn't respond to it, so we sued them. We sued the NSA and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And we've, uh, because we sued them, received some documents, very, very few, um, that talk about the development of this, of this process, but really don't go into any detail. Uh, I will say that tomorrow is the last release as part of our suit, so Fingers crossed, maybe we'll see the policy and we'll, we'll know a whole lot more tomorrow morning about exactly how the government does this, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, so far, it looks like they, they really don't have much of a policy in place. And we've seen other stories, aside from the Heartbleed story, um, notably one in The Intercept about the CIA's hacker jamboree, uh, where they use, use all kinds of vulnerabilities to hack Apple devices and others. Um, and no, no mention in there or in any of the documents that went along with it of any kind of equities process, so we'll see. Um, and just to be clear, there, there is no law in the United States banning the sale of exploits. There is such a law in Europe, and that's called the, the Vosnar Arrangement. Uh, the Vosnar Arrangement has been signed but not ratified by the United States. It is not in force here. Uh, and we have spoken uh, early and often and will continue to do so that the Vosnar Arrangement, if uh, adopted into United States domestic law would violate the First Amendment as written. Um, and it would have serious negative effects on this community. So the Vosnar arrangement, bad. I mean, not, not everything about Vosnar is bad, but there, there are significant portions of Vosnar. The portions that you guys care about are all bad. Next. So I had a question about uh, Warren Canaries and how effective they actually are in determining whether or not a company has been served with an NSL. And kind of more specifically, is there ever a situation where, as part of the NSL, they could, the government could stipulate that they have to continue the Warren Canary in order to prevent from people from finding out? Or if after the fact, the government could you know, impose some fine or something like that for the use of a Warren Canary so the, the short, I'll, I'll let Kirk give the long answer, but the short answer is warrant canaries have never been tested in court. 
Okay. Uh, but I'll, I'll give the, the, the longer answer. So a, a, as an initial matter, I mean, a, a warrant canary is kind of an interesting thing. As, as Nate said, it it's, hasn't been tested. Um, and, and in a sense, it is, uh, you know, a, a entity, a service provider, being as honest and transparent about government process as the law allows. And so if they have never received a national security letter, then they publish, a, you know, so for example, a transparency report, and you put zero in the column for national security letters. And in a, a, a recent uh, a lawsuit uh, concerning transparency about national security letters, uh, the government conceded in their, in their responsive papers that uh, while they think it's a terrible idea and no one should do this, that it was not illegal to say zero if you have never received a national security letter. And that, you know, uh, that, that's right. Uh, there, uh, the obligations that arise with a national security letter do not arise until you receive one. So then the interesting question arises, if you do receive them, then what? And so if you previously said zero, can you, <coughs> do you now have an obligation to lie to your customers and continue to say zero, even though this is now false. That is to say, can the government compel you to say false speech? Um, and that is a question which hasn't been addressed in the warrant canary context. It has been addressed in several other contexts. Uh, so for example, the government can compel you to say truthful speech from time to time. Uh, so uh, an example of where that, that has come up uh, was, is uh, smoking uh, cigarette uh, warnings. Uh, where you are compelled to put a warning on a pack of cigarettes if you're going to sell that in, in commerce. Um, and you know, another, another example that came up was that uh, Planned Parenthood uh, challenged a requirement that they tell people who were interested in getting uh, an abortion that they would have an increased uh, ideation of suicide if they did so, or at least that was likely. Uh, Planned Parenthood challenged that. One of the questions that the court addressed was, was there science behind this? Was this a truthful thing? They, they felt that, that uh, it was a sufficiently established as truthful, uh, and then uh, the uh, uh, plan porter was required to give out that, that information. Um, and so it would be a, a fairly uh, new thing if the government could compel false speech. However, not being tested in a national security context, the government would probably argue that perhaps that was important. Um, the way that I would like to see this challenged uh, is well in advance of the disclosure so that uh, if somebody had previously said zero and then came into a circumstance where they got a national security letter, uh, this would be a really great time to call your counsel. And if you don't have one, info at EFF.org would be a, a good good way to, uh, to reach out uh, because it would be best to go to the court for a declaration of whether or not you are required to do this uh, before the time period it comes where you either have to do it or not do it. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's some concern that, uh, if the, you know, uh, if it's in an emergency situation and the FBI is telling the court, you know, blood will be on your hands unless you require this, uh, that, that courts do not necessarily, uh, uh, want to do something that is radical and would change, uh, you know, endanger somebody without fully considering it. So, uh, so we want to uh, 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 come at the court under the right circumstances. So, I guess the the, the longer answer uh, to sum up is uh, uh, it hasn't been tested in court. Contact your counsel uh, should this uh, situation arise, and uh, we'll we will hope for uh, for the best. And I think there was a second part to your question too, which is how reliable. Is it, if a canary goes away, how certain can I be that this company did receive an NSL? And the, the answer is it depends. Uh, and it, it's, there are a lot of reasons a canary could go down, right? The person in charge of updating it, if it's a standalone canary, could forget to update it or be sick or be fired, right? The, um, if it's in a transparency report, other sections of the corporation might decide to change that transparency report for business reasons, or uh, you know, maybe their lawyers have advised them not to have a canary, and so they've removed it for that reason, right? So I think each case where there's a warrant canary and it changes or goes away needs to be taken into consideration on its own, right? And you can do things like reach out to the organization and say, 
hey, you had a warrant canary and it's changed. What happened there? And if they say, oh, we forgot to update it, then you know, right? Or if they say no comment, right, then you might uh, have a better idea. But the deal is you can't really ever know, right? And that's because of the gag order. There's, you know, there there is really no surefire way to tell. So, you know, you just have to essentially do a little bit of threat modeling and decide whether or not it's worth the, you know, how likely you think it is and whether or not you want to continue using that service. And, and just uh, on, on a related note, we, we also um, are in the process of challenging the underlying gag as unconstitutional. Uh, so we represent uh, two companies. We can't tell you their names because they're under gags. Uh, but both of them have challenged the gag order associated with an NSL that they have received. Uh, and we, uh, we won at the first level of courts, uh, where the court found it was an unconstitutional gag, uh, but stayed its decision pending the government's appeal. Uh, the government, of course, did appeal. Uh, we argued that case before the Ninth Circuit, uh, right here in San Francisco. I, I argued this case, uh, in October, uh, just a few blocks from here at the Ninth Circuit building. And we are awaiting the, the court's decision. Uh, six months is not an unusual time frame. Uh, so we, we are hopeful that we'll, we'll come soon, but, uh, we don't, we don't know when it'll be. We just have, I think, ten minutes, so time for two more questions, I think. Sure, yeah. So it seems like there, there appears to be, uh, quite a bit of momentum around new cybercrime laws, uh, in Washington, of which, uh, many may impact security researchers due to the broadening of the debt you know, lack of definition in the technicalities of what we do. Can you kind of update the researchers on that and what, if there's anything we should be doing in the short term that may, uh, you know, put us in harm's way? Um, well, to, to, uh, let me see how best to answer that. I mean, so we have uh, a couple of proposals that have come out of the, uh, of the White House. Uh, one uh, is the cyber information sharing uh, Bill, and that, that seems to, uh, have some momentum. Uh, another is a, a set of, uh, changes to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is sort of the primary anti-hacking law. That's probably the one that, uh, as security researchers, you should be the most concerned about. Um, and there's another one which is about, uh, reporting when there are security breaches. Uh, so you should at least pay attention to that one. Um, and there, there are other processes which are underway. Uh, to focus sort of briefly on what I think is, is the one of, of most concern to this community, uh, the, the White House has proposed uh, a set of proposals which is actually similar to what they have proposed in the past. These are not new ideas, uh, but they are adding the, oh my God, Sony just got hacked, you've got to do something, uh, you know, uh, cyber, cyber, cyber to it. Um, and so that, that may give it a little bit more, uh, momentum. Um, now, none of the things that they have proposed, if they had been in place, would have made a difference in the Sony hack. It not actually, would not have helped. But, you know, these sort of things don't necessarily matter in, in, in DC. Um, and it has a couple of provisions which are very concerning to us. Um, one is, uh, that there was a, a, um, a provision which uh, uh, had talked about um, sharing of passwords, and they broadened that to talk about sharing of means of access, and, and this was not defined. Um, there, there are certainly concerns that means of access is fairly broad. Like, you know when you're sharing a password, there are times when actually it can be quite legitimate to, to share a, a, a password. You might point out that a vulnerability is that this thing has this default password and, and so on. But uh, nevertheless, it, it is a fairly narrow circumstance. Means of access, there are a lot of things when you're doing a proof of concept, uh, you know, an exploit, you could decide that to be a, a means of access. And so the, the limitation that they put on this um, is, in, in not, not in so many words, that you're, you're doing it sort of um, in, in a bad way. Um, and, you know, doing it in a bad way is also much broader than doing something illegal. Uh, I, I would, I would ha hopeful that, that, of course, no one would say that, like, uh, talking about a, a vulnerability is one of these bad ways because it embarrasses the company. 
uh, but I don't want to give prosecutors the opportunity to make that argument. Um, and then a second aspect of it is uh, there's currently a, a provision about exceeding authorized access. Uh, and so this is when uh, uh, you have some forms of access to a system and then you uh, exceed what you are given. And there are some ways of doing that which are kind of like hacking that, that may make sense to be in an anti-hacking law uh, where you're, you're, you're going past a technical protection matter, you're, you're escalating your privileges. Um, and there are other ways of exceeding authorized access which are not technology-based. They're not hacking in any kind of traditional sense. Uh, and, and that is something like where there is a policy that says you shouldn't do that, but there is no technical reason why you should not. So this policy may be in a terms of use for the website, uh, or it may be in an employee handbook that says what employees may do. And we've, we've taken the position, and, and several uh, circuit courts, uh, appellate courts have agreed, that uh, you shouldn't criminalize what is essentially a breach of contract. Even if the, the, the terms of service of the 17 magazine online website says no one under 18 shall look at this site, it shouldn't be a felony if a 17-year-old goes and look at 17 magazine. They've since changed that term from their, their position. Uh, so it's no longer a potential felony. But nevertheless, like we were pointing out some of these ridiculous things, uh, and, and courts have agreed, and what the Department of Justice would like to do would be to uh, change that so it is uh, clearer that, that violations of uh, terms of use and terms of service can be treated as exceeding authorized access. Uh, they put some, some limitations on that, um, but those limitations are not satisfactory. So uh, a as it stands, uh, their CFAA proposal is a fairly dangerous piece of legislation if it is interpreted negatively. Uh, obviously, if it did pass, we would go to the courts and, and try to get the courts to interpret it in a, in a good manner. And, uh, but it would be far better if it, if it didn't pass. Uh, and we'll see. It, it hasn't gotten the kind of legs uh, that uh, some of the other uh, provisions have. So we have two minutes left, so we'll, we'll give it one last question. Well, where are you guys at with the um, the battle with the ESA over the DMCA uh, exception for museums uh, when it comes to preserving old software and games? The DMCA exemption process. Um, have either of you guys worked on that? I don't think any of us on stage have. Oh, really? Yeah. So so we have been involved as an institution in the, uh, the DMCA. Uh, the DMCA is a Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It has a every three year process where you can seek uh, exemptions from rules that would otherwise prohibit you from hacking on DRM uh, materials. And I, I believe that uh, we have filed several comments uh, seeking exemptions. Um, I know that there was an exemption that would uh, was proposed that would allow for the preservation of old video games. Uh, but I have not worked on that project, so my colleagues have, so I don't know uh, uh, whether we were directly involved in that or not. Oh, no, I might know. All right, great. I know a little. Um, this is specifically with running like game servers or stuff for abandoned video games. And I think the state of it currently is that we submitted our comment. Um, the games company submitted rebuttals. It was turned down. And I think there's an additional phase of comments going on. And I think we're going to resubmit. Uh, to try to get it to pass, otherwise possibly do things outside of the normal um, DMCA exemption process to get it to pass. Um, on the previous question um, of uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, it's um, important to note, and I'm not a lawyer, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, that there are local statutes as well. Um, that are um, subject to you know, that being overwritten by local uh, law. Um, in a recent case, um, there was an eighth grader uh, in Florida uh, who was um, charged with a felony for changing the background uh, of his teacher's desktop. Um, so uh, this is, you know, particularly egregious case, and this is because the minimum requirements of the law in Florida are that the the perpetrator the the alleged perpetrator should be um, charged with a felony rather than a misdemeanor? The CFAA mandates a, a misdemeanor be charged. So. Um. Oh 
Oh, yeah, so I, I should have added just one other thing. Oh, well, never mind. We got the stop now, so all right, I'll just quickly add. Uh, one of the other changes in the White House proposal about the CFAA is they basically eliminated misdemeanors. Everything is a felony with a, one or two small exceptions. Uh, and here's the thing is that, you know, there, there are people, uh, in, in, who, who like to hack on computers and might be doing something that maybe, you know, we don't want to say is completely great, but it probably would be best if it could be charged as a misdemeanor so that they can go on and lead productive aspects of society afterwards. That having everything be a felony where the choice is either it's totally cool or it's a five year penalty, uh, it really doesn't give the, the space for people to, to make a minor mistake, uh, know that it was a mistake and nevertheless be able to continue to be contributing members of society. All right. So thank you very much. We loved your questions. Uh, and, and thank you for uh, coming to B-Sides.